Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Hee Jung Yoon, your MC for this session. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you. These days, environmental issues have become more important than ever they can no longer be overlooked. So, now, let us talk about how climate change will affect the post-COVID era and the ways to solve these problems. The climate and environmental session will be divided into two sessions. First, for the first session, we would like to invite Professor Samuel Bowles, Professor Che Jae Chan, and Seoul Mayor Park Won Soon. We are also running this session live via Seoul City's YouTube channel, and the people around the world are watching this in real time. Now, let me introduce today's speakers from home and abroad. First of all, we have Professor Che Jae Chun, Chair Professor of Natural Science at Ihua Women's University. Next, we are joined by Simon Smith, British Ambassador. Please welcome him. We are also joined by Yi Yu Jin, a senior research fellow at Green Transition Institute. She's well known as an active environmentalist. Next, it is my honor to introduce Park Won Soon, Mayor of Seoul, who is the host of the CAC Global Summit 2020. <laughs> Last but not least, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Samuel Bowles. Professor Samuel Bowles is a worldwide renowned specialist in behavioral economics, and he is also known as the author of The Moral Economy. Good afternoon, Professor Samuel Bowles. Hello. <clears throat> yes, thank you for being with us today. Before we begin today's session, we would like to have a special congratulatory speech. Let's take a look who has sent us a video. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to speak at the Cities Against the COVID-19 Global Summit. At the outset, I'd like to give my greatest gratitude and thanks to the medical workers around the world who are battling against COVID-19 on the front lines. I would also like to thank the Honorable Mayor Park Won Soon of Seoul Metropolitan City for convening this important global summit. Ladies and gentlemen, life as we knew it has changed. It is now the time for us to figure out how to live in a new era of the aftermath of the pandemic. His Holiness Pope Francis has commented that the global pandemic may be one of the nature's responses to the man-made climate crisis. Multiple researches have shown that there is a clear relationship uh, between the worsening of the environment and the outbreak of viral diseases such as COVID-19. The global outbreak of this pandemic is a wake-up call for us to stop sacrificing the environment for the sake of economic growth. We must embrace a new paradigm that aligns economic growth with a sustainable environment. Korea has already set a great example for the world through its remarkable COVID-19 response strategy, dubbed as the three T's of testing, tracing, and treatment. I hope that Korea will set another model example uh, through the implementation of its Green New Deal agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, the vast scale of this the pandemic, as well as the climate crisis, 
requires united efforts of a global scale. The whole planet must work as one in the face of such a crisis. In particular, I urge developed countries to make an extra effort to support the global south, which may lack adequate resources and tools. In this era of globalization and connectivity, we must focus key resources and tools to developing countries to truly eradicate COVID-19. With that, dear distinguished participants, I look forward to hearing many eye-opening ways on how to align life in a post-COVID era with climate action. Let us gather wisdom to build a new and sustainable way of life for the present and the future. Let us work together to make this world better for all. Thank you. 감사합니다. Yes, it is Ban Ki-moon, chairman of the NCCA. He delivered his congratulatory speech for today's conference. Thank you. Next, we would like to have Professor Samuel Bose. Today, Professor will be talking on COVID-19, climate change, and the moral economy. We are looking forward to hearing from him. Professor, are you ready? Please begin your presentation. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I want to thank also Mr. Mayor for bringing us together here, the people of Seoul and the people of Korea for all that you've done as an example to the rest of the world. Uh, as you can see, I want to talk about the moral economy. What you're looking at is a beautiful, ugly, frightening fresco from the 15th century during the time of those plagues. I hope you can see in the upper right that they are washing their hands as they should. Now, uh, I want to talk about paradigm, a change in paradigm, and I'll be using some words, paradigm, vernacular, narrative. So let me start with narrative. The narrative is basically a way of telling a story about events. So, for example, during the New Deal and the social democratic aftermath of the Great Depression and the Second World War, there was a story about what happened and why it happened. The Great Depression occurred, people said, because work workers weren't paid well enough to buy the goods that they produced. The, the Great Depression ended, people would say, because of the deficit spending by the governments. The, that was a story that made sense of what had happened during that period of time. Other stories competed with it, but that was the one, the Social Democratic New Deal one, that won the day. Now, a vernacular is simply the everyday speech which is common in a population. So now let's think about another paradigm in the everyday speech of that. In the neoliberal para paradigm, there is a vernacular which has such phrases as Margaret Thatcher's, there's no such thing as society, or labor unions are just special interest groups. Finally, a policy paradigm is composed of four parts. The first is a set of ethical commitments. The second is an economic model. The third are a set of emblematic policies which reflect these ideas. And finally, there is the vernacular, the way people talk about the economy and society if they're part of that paradigm. So let me take my examples here from another uh, paradigm, classical liberalism of the 18th and 19th century. The ethical foundations included such things as equal dignity. The economics special, uh, emphasized comparative advantage division of labor. The emblematic policies included an end to monopolies and, uh, and against tariffs. And finally, it entered the vernacular through the literature of the period. For example, even in Alice, and Alice in Wonderland, Alice once said to the queen in that famous uh, uh, book, she said, it's all done by people minding their own business. Well, the new narrative that will emerge from the COVID-19 crisis uh, will have much in common with what came out of the Great Depression and the New Deal. But it will not simply be limited to debates about where we should locate on this continuum from markets to government. Uh, I put these forward, uh, these, these, these alternatives forward to you as a dimension that, that still matters, it will matter, but I want to say we have to go beyond it. 
on the right, we have markets which are run motivated by motives like material incentives, uh, greed. They're implemented by prices and competition. And over on the left, the government is based on compliance with state authority by citizens, and it's implemented by government mandates, elections, and so on. Uh, and, and you can see there, are, there you could have various kinds of policies aligned in, uh, along this uh, spectrum. Now, uh, I think that we're going to see a poll, a third poll. Uh, I call it community or civil society, uh, which uh, takes up the motives that are, that are missing from the blue line. Things like solidarity and duty, the things which uh, underpin community and go way beyond material gain and compliance with governmental fiat. Now, I don't mean to say that the blue line's unimportant. You can see at the top there, important uh, policies for dealing with climate change can be arrayed along that line, and that would help us to think about what our alternatives are. Um, now, the narrative has changed before. Uh, throughout the 19th century uh, and into the 20th century, um, classical liberalism, uh, and along with neoclassical economics, was basically the paradigm that uh, was dominant. But because of the Great Depression and also the Second World War, as I said, a new paradigm emerged. I think we can learn something from the last time we had a really big paradigm shift. We can learn something which is both hopeful and also a challenge to us here today. We know that at the height of the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, said, heedless self-interest is bad economics. And we also know that Paul Samuelson, the great economist, wrote his path-breaking textbook, uh, Economics, shortly after the war. Well, I think we are now facing a situation in which similar types of changes in ideology and teaching and language and in policy will take place. COVID-19 and climate change provide an opportunity for a similar shift. Now, let's ask, what can we learn uh, from what we're observing that people are doing? Well, I'll just give you a couple of examples. The National Health Service in the UK uh, asked for a quarter of a million volunteers to help them assisting uh, in delivering food and medicine. They had to stop the recruitment almost immediately because they had three quarters of a million applications of people who wanted to do that. Um, in Germany, um, this is less well known, but uh, a recent survey showed that significantly more people said that they would comply with social distancing, with being vaccinated or using a, a tracing app on their phone if the advice was voluntary than if the advice was enforced as a matter of law. But looking at the data there, it's quite obvious that distrust in government and distrust of scientific information explain these results. Uh, well, let's go back to the um, uh, kinds of um, uh, policies that are being laid, laid out. Uh, there's, of course, a battle for the narrative, but interestingly, uh, you're finding some strange uh, participants. Uh, the Economist, the great British uh, magazine, said, well, we've, we have a large pandemic state now, but we can't have a large pandemic state after the pandemic. We have to somehow get it shrunk down. Surprisingly, the Financial Times said something quite different. Uh, it said, we have to experiment with new policies, which until now we have thought of as being eccentric. And they specifically mentioned taxes on wealth and an unconditional basic income. This was by their editorial board, and here's the editorial. I, I'm showing you the picture of it. Uh, interestingly, uh, what they chose to feature here was volunteers delivering food. Uh, they wanted to emphasize the fact that much of what we have to address now has to do with ethical concerns of solidarity that we've come to realize are so important in addressing COVID-19 and are also essential to addressing um, climate change. Um, here's another little piece of evidence. Almost every country in the world has had to write down which are the essential occupations. Uh, now, um, as an economist, I know, well, I know which occupations are valuable. All we have to do is look in the labor market. The labor market provides the answer by saying, oh, this person makes twice as much as the other person. We'll let the wages or salaries be our indicator of value. But it, this is a list from the UK. 
if you look at the list there, you'll see the ones in yellow are actually not paid very much at all. Waste disposal workers, uh, those involved in food processing and so on. So we're being asked now, and we are avidly taking up the challenge of saying, well, what really is essential? Do we really want to let the market uh, do the job of deciding what's important and what is not? Uh, now, uh, ethical and generous and solidaristic norms have been essential to, to addressing the pandemic. Well, unfortunately, they're absent from economics or primarily absent from it. Well, here's another piece of evidence. These women are working in a, in a meat processing plant in the United States. Uh, uh, the infection rates in those plants are very high. These women are risking their lives and lives of their families. A great many of them did not want to come to work. But they were required to come to work as a condition of keeping their job. Now, that's a private exercise of power by their employers over them, asking them to take extraordinary risks with their lives. Many think that in the private sector, that kind of, any kind of power of that nature should be made accountable through democratic procedures, and we should be protected from it. But again, questions like this are not being raised in economics, or at least I should say they haven't been until very recently. Now, um, a lot of what we will have learned from the pandemic is uh, uh, surprisingly already part of modern economics if you look at the research that's been done recently. To start with, economists have come to understand that good laws and good incentives are no substitute for good citizens. If the citizens are immoral and self-interested, well then market incentives and government orders and so on, no matter how cleverly designed they are, they may backfire and they certainly won't be sufficient to address the challenges of a pandemic. So good citizens are essential. Um, this is research uh, which has been done in mechanism design, including some of it, a uh, um, modest contribution by my, uh, by my co-author and me, Professor Huang Sung Ah. Um, the good news is there are a lot of good citizens around. Uh, unlike the assumptions of the economic paradigm, uh, we've observed tremendous sacrifices that pe people have made, generosity uh, and trust. And this is, of course, a lesson consistent with the last three decades of behavioral economics. But here's a warning. Uh, our regard for the well-being of others, altruism, reciprocity, and so on, also includes hostility towards outsiders. And the pandemic may provide some, a fertile ground uh, for the cultivation of these tribalistic feelings. Uh, fre frequent reference by the U.S. president to the Chinese virus being an example. So uh, we have to think hard about this. Uh, Tribalism, not cooperation, is a possible outcome of the challenge which you're now facing. Uh, much of this re the research I've done on this has been jointly uh, with Professor Choi, uh, who I've, I've written many articles with about human evolution and the evolution of both narrow-minded insider-outsider tribalistic values along with um, altruistic ones. So let's come back to this line, uh, the alternatives between market and government. Um, uh, and I said we should add something to it, another dimension, but what is that? Well, what I call civil society or community, it provides essential elements for a strategy to kill COVID-19 without killing the economy. There are two basic elements. Uh, one is private contract and governmental orders are limited. But the good news is socially oriented economic actors and citizens and make up for that and provide alternative spaces in which economic discourse can take place and also in which we can experiment with new institutions. That space is all, will be one in which we look at and interrogate the private exercise of power and the essential role of social norms. So instead of a line, let's think of a triangle. Now, the, uh, the triangle is a space and the poles mean the same thing. So the markets and government are poles of this thing. But now we have a third pole, which is civil society. Um, any point in this space is a uh, type of institution or rules of the game or set of motivations which combines elements of the three poles. I think this is a reasonable way to look at the, the alternatives before us. So, for example, across the top, I've already uh, made reference to 
cap and trade policies for climate change fairly close to markets. A little closer to government would be a carbon tax and, and, and citizen dividend. But also look way down in the, in the bottom of the triangle in red, civil society led zero net carbon consumption. This is something that people do as a matter of their own morality. They do it as a matter of peer pressure. It's not imposed by governments. It's not incentivized by markets. But let's think further um, about what we've learned about this new space for policies. Uh, but let me say one thing more about the civil society. I've listed their motives, which are essential to this. Reciprocity, altruism, fairness, sustainability. But in red, because I want everyone to think about this hard, it also includes identity. That is including the favoritism of, towards the in-group. Um, now, if we use this apparatus to study the COVID uh, um, crisis, uh, well, there's ample room here for experiments uh, in all parts of the policy space. So up in the upper left, uh, you can see, oh, there's free childcare, which was mandated by the Australian government. They promised to take it away once it's over, but they promised they, they're doing it now. Uh, also in the government uh, area, mandatory risk sharing, that's through transfers, essentially public insurance against job loss. Uh, other things closer to markets, um, when Qantas Airlines uh, fired uh, 20,000 people, they were immediately hired by the Australian government for contact uh, tracing. Uh, and look on the left edge of the graph between government and civil society. Uh, virus testing and tracing in South Korea is a marvelous example of combining government with civil society, partly obedience and partly social pressure, partly a swift action by a government which is then supported by, avidly, by one's neighbors and friends. And I've located throughout the, throughout the triangle other possible, um, uh, other things that have happened during this, the, the paradigm from which we can learn. Um, now, the coming paradigm shift, which I'm advocating here, uh, it has to succeed, but under conditions quite unlike the last major shift in the aftermath of the Second World War and the Great Depression. Now, as was the case with the Second World War and the Great Depression, we're not going to be the same after this. It's a new world. Uh, the way we talk about the economy and society and each other is going to change. But the... The paradigm shift that happened then had some advantages, which is the pandemic of that era, massive unemployment and economic insecurity, that was beaten by new rules of the game that delivered immediate benefits to people. So, for example, unemployment insurance, a larger role for government expenditures, and in many countries, trade union bargaining over wage setting and the adoption of new technology. Now. The, these were what I called emblematic policies. They reflected the ethics of the new paradigm. They also were part of the economics. They were justified by the economics of the new paradigm. And they rapidly became part of the vernacular, part of the way everyone talked about how the economy worked. Now, the result was the most prosperous period in the history of capitalism, of shared affluence. It's called the golden age of capitalism from roughly 1948 until the end of the 60s. The fact that, uh, that the economic systems around the world did extraordinarily well in most places, uh, at least in the higher and middle income countries, made it very difficult to dislodge the, the, the new paradigm. So the vernacular really stuck uh, and it became very hard to contest with. It was eventually defeated by the neoliberal. And so I want to close with this question. Um, what are the political and economic and narrative foundations of a Green New Deal? Um, my sense of paradigms being successful is this. They are successful if they provide a story that people can tell about their lives, which, uh, in which their values are, are expressed, uh, in which we see the policies are reflected that, that, uh, that embody those values. And those policies make the economy work well so that for most people, they're better off under that, that paradigm. Uh, now, is that the case today? Do we have a similar environment that can allow us to do that? Well, yes, I think we very well might. The mounting costs, not for the future, but for the present, the mounting costs for us today of climate change and recurrent pandemic threats will provide an environment in which a new paradigm could 
like the uh, post Great Depression paradigm. Guide a synthesis, uh, synthesis between new policies and institutions, which can provide, provide enough concrete benefits so that it can survive and expand politically. Let me close with this. Um, uh, this conference has brought together the issue of COVID-19 and climate change. Many other people, uh, for example, Mark Carney, who just stepped down as the governor of the Bank of England, said, uh, we're not going to get a vaccine against climate change. We can't self-isolate from climate change. And here's an optimistic thing. Uh, every year, I've been asking students around the world, what do you think economics should be about? Thousands and thousands of students have, done, have answered this with, uh, before they started studying introductory economics. And usually they say inequality. Uh, but last year uh, at the University College London, there was a big shift. The word cloud there tells you that the students of today are asking us, the intellectuals, the social scientists, uh, the biologists, and so on, uh, they really, really want us to focus on this as part of what they are going to learn. And we owe it to the young people today to change what we're teaching as part of changing our vernacular as the foundation of a new paradigm. I want to thank you all, and I congratulate the people of Korea and of Seoul for the wonderful example you've given for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your meaningful words. As Professor mentioned, I believe good cities will overcome this pandemic. And now, Professor Che Jae-chun will give us a presentation on a time for ecological turn. Please welcome him. Hello. COVID-19. This is absolutely unprecedented event. Nearly anyone living alive at the moment has ever, ever seen this kind of thing before in their entire lives. This is, I believe, a time for ecological turn. When you look back, SARS, MERS, and this time COVID, we are told that it all began from bats. Well, bats probably are very, uh, very uh, sad about this news. They're not, they're not really trying to uh, hurt us. Um, you, don't, you don't believe that bats and civet, pangolin and camel, they voluntarily visit our bedroom while we're sleeping and deliver the virus to us. No, everything we did to ourselves, we went to, to uh, disturb these animals and the virus and, and other germs living on these animals had to jump out of these animals and they somehow land on us. It's not their intention, it's just happened. Now, climate change is another pandemic crisis, just like uh, COVID-19. Climate change and biodiversity depletion have very close ties with this sort of pandemic uh, influenza uh, crisis. Let me say why. I just said uh, the bat seems to be the origin of some of these viruses. When you compare the biodiversity of mammalian species between temperate regions and tropical regions, excluding bat species, we are almost exactly the same. There's the same number of species of mammals live in the tropics and in the temperate regions. But when you add bats to it, the change is tremendous. The, in the tropics, there are many, many bats living. But this is changing because of global warming. Many, many bat species are moving into temperate regions. So we get to, we're, we're getting closer to uh, habitats of bats and other animals that, uh, that interact with bats. What I'm trying to say here is there's increasing chances that we get to meet uh, zoonotic pathogens ever before. That's just a simple 
simple uh, encounters I'm talking about, but the human species is a weird animal, in my opinion. We actually、uh, seek the chances. When you go to a place like Nairobi, Kenya, you can go to a place like this, bushmeat restaurants. When you look at the、uh, the top menus, there are the common menus. We can eat those in in any place in the world, but the the bottom menus are the interesting ones. They will tell you today we have zebra, then you can eat zebra meat that day. Crocodile, sometimes、uh, the all all different kinds of uh, primate uh, meat as well. In In old days,、uh, one time I wrote an article with the title called、uh, "A Road to the Wood Brings Ruin Upon Us." The village people in Africa always hunt because they have to feed their families high proteins. But they used to catch maybe you know one animal or two animal a day or a week. But these days. Lumber companies have built a very wide road deep into the forest, and along this road, the hunters go in, and they catch many, many more animals than before. They have to deliver these meat to bushmen restaurants, which are now open, even in the big cities like、uh, Paris and London. So this is. Absolutely crazy! We actually go in and、uh, disturb these wild animals.、Um, our ancestors really never did that. The wild animals live in the forest.、Uh, we live in the、uh, civilized society. But these things happen. And when you look at this problem from germs' point of view, the virus and bacteria, their their hosts are disturbed, so they had to. Kind of jump out of those animals. When they jump out of it, they land on something. Chances are they will find themselves either on human species, Homo sapiens, because there are 7.7 billions of us on Earth. So there's a very good chance that they will land on us. And other animals are like domestic animals we raise. There are absolute majority in animal kingdom these days, so that's why we we're having trouble with the avian influenza and swine virus and all these kind of things. What am I telling you? These kind of epidemics or pandemics will go away and it will never happen. No, I'm saying, in terms of probability, this will happen again. This will happen again and again, probably with more, with a higher frequency, because the number of human species and our animals will increase in time. Let me,、um, oops, let me go back. Most people these days are saying, unless we develop vaccine, this crisis will never end. I have a slightly different opinion. I'm not saying we shouldn't develop vaccine. I am all for it. We really have to work hard to develop good vaccine. But that's not the only solution. If you look back, SARS, MERS, Ebola, AIDS, there's no vaccine. You have to wonder why, because it takes time to develop. Usually one year or three years. That's when everything goes very well. And once you develop vaccine, you have to test to people whether it's、uh, safe or is effective. But by the time when by the time you develop the vaccine, things get calmed down quite a bit. So you don't have enough people to test. So pharmaceutical companies don't find it very economical. So they bail out, bail themselves out. This is probably why we don't have vaccines for those、uh, viral infectious diseases. Let me offer you two other vaccines. In my opinion, perhaps more realistic and more effective.
there are behavior vaccine and echo vaccine. Social distancing is a good, good example of behavior vaccine. We have evolved to, to understand how, how disease uh, attack us. So when we are informed that we need to keep some distance, we do it very well. This is behavior vaccine. And there is even more fundamental vaccine. If we don't touch wild animals, then these zoonotic pathogens will never come from wild animals to us. We need to think about a new way, much more cautious way to deal with a wild ecosystem. That's what I call echo vaccine. Don't you think these two vaccines are much, much easier for us to, to, get, uh, to get implemented? Well, uh, Yuval Harari came to Korea in 2016. I had a great honor to meet with him. Well, we had a very nice chat. In his book, Sapiens, he more or less, more or less uh, predicted that uh, the human species will, will go extinct in about 300 years or 400 years. Uh, when we first met, we began with that conversation. Uh, but he was quite shocked <laughs> when, I, when I said, well, why, why, why should we wait that long? Um, I'm not going to be surprised if we go extinct within this, within this century, by the end of this century. And he was very upset and kept asking me questions. I wasn't joking, and I'm not, I'm not really praying for such thing happen. But the way we do, when you look at the uh, climate, climate crisis and COVID-19 crisis, I, I, I can't really believe we are really that uh, sapient species. We're not really that wise. We're very brilliant animals, but the way we behave looks like we want to kill ourselves. We, we want to go as, as quickly as possible. This is very silly, and we need to do some, something so drastic to save our very, very own future. Now, geologists uh, have decided to call the current period of current geological era, the Anthropocene. This is actually quite ridiculous. Usually, a uh, geological period uh, is a very long period. And by the time, let me, let me put it this way, um, after we go, we've gone extinct and another intelligent animal uh, rules the Earth, they will laugh at us. What have, what have these guys have done? That's such a short period of time. They name it Anthropocene. But we had to do it because the impact we are putting on Earth is unheard. No other species in the history of Earth, history of Earth has done anything close to this. This is very serious. Maybe about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, perhaps, uh, at the end of last millennium, uh, I was invited to give a talk in, in, in Tokyo, and I argued that we need to do an ecological turn. We had experienced linguistic turn, cultural turn, and people are talking about informational turn, technological turn, all kinds of things. But in my opinion, all other turns are not that important because our very own existence on this planet is threatened. So in this uh, era, we need to really embrace ecological turn. So I suggest that we, we even uh, change our scientific name from Homo sapiens to Homo symbios the ones who, who are willing to live together with other animals or plants and even other uh, human beings. Let me add one more thing at this point. 
we've been using uh, the expression environmental, environment friendly quite often these days. Environment friendly industries, environmental friendly uh, uh, government and all that. But now I think back, this expression is, is a mere excuse. We haven't done much. We, we did uh, business as usual. And then we're saying, we're not that bad. We're, we're trying to be environment friendly. Now, in the post-COVID era, I don't think we, are, we will be satisfied with this expression. We will be looking at which companies are eco-centered. We'll be looking at who is eco-centered uh, behavior, uh, behave, behaving people. What government is eco-centered? Whatever they do, they want to keep eco right in the middle of, of their policies and their activities. And consumers will have a bright eyes to look for these kind of things from now on. And we'll ask a question, something like this. Would that company contribute to the next, next pandemic? I don't want to buy the products from that company if that company is contributing to, to another pandemic. We need to do ecological turn. Thank you. Thank you for your insightful speech. So we should recognize the seriousness of climate change to prevent the con contagious disease. Next, it is my honor to invite Mayor Park Won Soon for giving us a presentation on Seoul's vision against climate crisis. Mayor Park, please begin your presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Won Soon Park. May of Seoul. So, but the audience are living in different parts of the world, so I can safely say that good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic has caused the unprecedented confusion and suffering that the world has never experienced. Paradoxically, there is one thing that is being revived in this unprecedented crisis, that is the Earth. So, as humankind was forced to cease its excessive activities due to the pandemic, the Earth has been recovering to its original self. This paradox of the Earth clearly shows a direction that all humankind must head to in post-corona era. There is a, to say, one step, one step forward toward the new future by overcoming the climate crisis. Behind the blessings of quantitative growth lies the curse of climate change. So as the crossroads of great transformation in terms of ecology and civilizations, COVID-19 is sending a clear signal to all humankind. It is telling us that the quantitative growth model focusing on efficiency, which results in overcrowding, destruction of this ecosystem, and greenhouse gas increase, will no longer be valid in the future. So we need to transform the urban operating system into a decarbonized version and create sustainable industries and jobs that do not create much carbons. So such practices will be the key to creating a livable city for the socially and economically disadvantaged. So we lead these changes through the Great New Deals. So even before COVID-19, Seoul has already taken one step ahead in infectious disease response. So under the slogan of citizens are the energy for the past eight years, Seoul has taken the lead in responding to climate change, strengthening solidarity and cooperation both home and abroad. 
the representative policy is one least nuclear power plant initiative, the citizen-led energy experiment, which I started immediately after I took office in 2011. With participation of 4.87 million citizens of all ages, we have implemented measures to save energy and enhance production of renewable energies. Thanks to this effort, we have saved energy equivalent to three nuclear power plants. The Echo Mileage campaign, in which 2.13 million Seoul citizens participate, has reduced emission of 2 million tons of greenhouse gases. So Seoul is also leading the way in building solidarity and cooperation with the international communities for coordinated response against climate change. So in addition, Seoul is implementing various ecologic projects such as urban farming and operating 25,000 Darungi shared bicycles, creating a synergistic effect. Based on these accomplishments, the Seoul Metropolitan Government will proactively implement the Green New Deals. So our goal is to hold global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees C, which is the red line for human survival. To this end, Seoul will transform itself into a net zero city that achieves zero carbon emissions. So Seoul declared to create good jobs and resolve social inequalities. Seoul promises to make a big investment in transition of ecology and civilization that will transform the green crisis into a green opportunity. According to the IPCC special report, the global temperature has increased one degree C above the pre-industrial levels. Now, we only have the 0.5 degree C margins until the Earth reaches the critical temperature for human survival. If global warming exceeds the red line of 1.5 degrees C, human survival will be threatened. So as humans are part of ecology, human life will also be at risk. So to be sure, Holding global warming below 1.5 degrees C is an ambitious goal for Seoul, a mega city of 10 million citizens. Nevertheless, Seoul has already laid solid foundations during the past eight years. In addition to as quarantine, Seoul will set the standard model for cities around the world and attracts active participation in climate change measures. Setting the standard begins with a shift in thinking. We need consilient thinking to achieve great integration between diverse fields, as Professor Treasure Chan, today moderator, emphasized. And we will integrate policies that were carried out separately and in programs under the green umbrella to create synergy effect. So first, Seoul will build green buildings across the city. Seoul will improve energy efficiency through expanding the mandatory zero energy buildings in public building and large scale green remodeling. Seoul will strictly limit the total greenhouse gas emissions from buildings and expand the construction of zero energy buildings. Also, we will regenerate the city with the citizens by repairing old buildings. So, we'll greatly increase power generation capacity of solar power to one gigawatt and of fuel cell to 300 megawatts by 2022. Second, so we'll open the green mobility area beyond pedestrian-friendly city. So we'll expand the working space for pedestrians by adjusting space for roads. 
We will also strengthen the bicycle lane infrastructure through increasing the number of shared bikes starting in 40,000 by 2022 and early establishment of cycle rapid transit, so-called CRT network. So we'll also commercialize smart mobility in different fields. By 2025, all vehicles for public institutions will be required to be electric cars or hydrogen-fueled cars. By 2022, we will expand the EV charging infrastructure so that charging is available within every five-minute driving. Third, so will enhance the role of parks as a safe green shelter. So will ensure all urban park plans, which are long pending, are implemented in order to preserve forests and gardens within the city. Together with our citizens, so we will plant 30 million trees by 2022. We have already planted 25 million trees across the city. Also, so we will create an urban ecosystem in which diverse living creatures coexist by restoring the ecology of the streams. Fourth, so we will achieve green ecological recycling. By 2025, Seoul will build more resource recovery facilities and establish new recycling facilities with the aim of achieving zero landfill of domestic waste. We will establish the green infrastructure for water supply and sewage to provide clean drinking water and sustainable use. We will use restore the nature of the Han River, the lifeline of Seoul. As Professional Samuel Bowles mentioned earlier, I fully agree with the theory of the moral economy where penalties and incentives for self-interested people would prevent voluntary behavior and cause competitive inequalities. Citizens need to be energy for change. Seoul is citizen-oriented city, where citizens participate in the entire governance process from policy planning to evaluations. The Green New Deal of Seoul will be designed to allow citizens to voluntarily participate in efforts to overcome the climate crisis. So furthermore, publicly deliberated the budget through which policies are directly planned and implemented by citizens will be expanded to 1 billion won by 2022. The current climate change and the global pandemic of COVID-19 triggered by climate crisis are adding pain to the socially disadvantaged first and most severely. Through the Green New Deal, Seoul will create more quality jobs I'm convinced that it will be the best cure and best welfare to ease the pain of socially disadvantaged. So, so we we'll also share the pain with the world. We will cooperate with international organizations such as the UN, WHO, as well as the Global City Network, such as C40, ECLAI, and CityNet. As the leader who sets the global standards, so we will take our full responsibility. The climate crisis is a tragedy that humankind has brought upon itself by excessively relying on fossil fuels and focusing on growth. And the last stop on this path is destruction of the civilizations. So COVID-19 is a timely warning to us signaling that the climate crisis is threatening humankind today and not in a distant future. So as history has shown us, crises also bring opportunities to reshape the existing order. In this crisis induced by COVID-19, now is the last opportunity to go decarbonized. 
with a desperate aspiration to protect the right to life for the future generations. So it will re-establish itself as the global standard environment city, along with our citizens. So we cooperate with the international community in taking a past solid step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing words. I could feel the mayor's strong will for Seoul's Green New Deal. Thank you. Moving on, we could like to watch a video on case of Seoul's energy self-sufficient villages. Please take a look. 마을이 옛날하고 지금하고 비교를 해보면 거의 뭐 100% 바뀌었다고 보, 보지요. 첫 걸음이 어렵다고 하잖아요. 근데 이렇게 한두 명이 하다 보면 줄일 수 있지 않을까 하는 생각이 들어요. 잘하는 그 공동 전기류가 제로 됐을 때 깜짝 놀랐어요. 아 이것이 이랬구나 이런 생각이 들더라고요. 한한달 지난 한두 달 동안 되게 기대를 많이 했었어요. 아, 도대체 얼마나 줄일 수 있을까. 어 결과를 보니까 지금까지는 기대 이상인 것 같아요. 그럼 이게 더 필요하다. 더 다르고 싶다. 또안 다른 사람들은 더 달게 좀 해줘라. 라고 이제 유칠 정도로 많이 홍보가 된 거죠. There are people here who have decided to live self-sufficient lives. These groups of people are Seoul's energy self-sufficient villages where people put efforts to generate their own electricity. The global temperature continues to get warmer by the day. In response to climate change challenges, the residents of the village voluntarily save energy and minimize the demand for external energy. <laughs> 어, 신대방 현대에서 3년 하기 전까지는 제가 이런 걸 생각해 본 적이 없어요. 뭐, 하려고 생각도 안 했었고. 근데 그 제가 3년을 겪으면서 아, 에너지를 절약해야겠다. The Energy Self-Sufficient Village Project that promotes It Starts With Me perspective has brought about a positive effect. 다, 저, 저, 4만 5천 원 내지 5만 원그 선에서 낸 걸로 지금 있거든요. 그런데 지금은 거의 제로. 그래서 4년 동안에 절감된 킬로와트가 91만 킬로와트예요. 돈으로는 2억 4천 금액이 줄어든 거예요. 17만 원대 나왔는데 지금은 12만 원대가 나옵니다. 우선은 관리비를 줄여줬고요. 또 아파트를 쾌적하게 해줬고 누이 좋고 매부 좋은 겁니다. In addition to reducing fuel costs and protecting the environment. The first full-scale step of energy self-sufficient villages' energy independence praxis is energy conservation. 안 쓰는 전기를 끈다든지 에너지가 많이 소모되는 그런 제품들에 대해서 좀 효율적으로 에너지를 사용할 수 있는 제품으로 바꾸는 활동을 한다든지 이렇게 동네 주민들이 쉽게 접근할 수 있는 활동부터 이제 시작을 한 거죠. Energy self-sufficient villages are practicing energy conservation through mobilizing people's engagement in community activities by civic education that provides motivation for energy conservation, a 3 plus 1 electricity saving know-how, and an eco-mileage incentive. Energy conservation 이웃 간에 소통을 하게 만드는 겁니다. 사람과 사람들이 만나고 거기에서 받는 힘과 이런 게 정말 전기 에너지 아닌 더큰 에너지가 어, 생활에 준다고 생각합니다. The deployment of eco-friendly boilers which save heating costs and resolves fine dust issues and energy and eco festivals and people who hold and enjoy the festivals. So what is the second step for energy self-sufficient villages? 그게 공동 전기료 같은 경우에도 한 2만 7천 원 이렇게 나오던 게 지금 만 원대 나오고요. 그때 LED를 교체를 하고 전기료를 저희가 80% 그때는 디밍으로 했기 때문에 80% 효과를 눈으로 이렇게 보고 관리비도 공동 전기료도 거의 없다시피. 
Building retrofit projects not only conserve energy, but also enhance the living conditions through energy efficiency enhancement projects to eliminate inefficient elements, such as replacing existing lights with LED lights, improving the insulation through double glazed windows and eco-friendly boilers. Solar City Seoul. The third and final step is producing energy such as new and renewable energy that includes solar power and storing the produced energy. 올해 모터를 보니까 태양의 도시더라고요. 이 태양광에 대한 이 발전기 시설은 수명이 25년에서 30년입니다. 그러면 지금 내가 나이가 65세인데 이 나이에 30년 후에 쓸수 있는 물건은 이 태양광밖에 없어요. 어, 저희 아파트가 옥상 태양광 대여 사업 서울시에서 두 번째로 설치한 아파트거든요. 지금은 아마 한 10호, 11호까지 아마 되어 있는데 제 아파트에서 견학을 하고 오셔가지고 아마 여기 주변에 있는 아파트에서 한 네다섯 군데 아파트에서 아마 설치를 하신 걸로 알고 있습니다. Producing its own energy means steering Seoul's future to an energy self-sufficient city. 옥상에 있는 태양광을 ESS 장치에 연결하는 거죠. 집 안에 있는 한전 전기 연결하지 말고. 배터리 연결해서 저장을 시키면 한전 전기가 나가도 태양광이 발전되면 ESS로 들어오고 ESS에 있는 걸 우리가 보조 배터리처럼 쓰면 되고. 어 전기차 충전 시설을 설치한다는 거는 오 전기차 충전 시설 설치해요? 그럼 전기차 사야겠네, 사도 되겠네. 이런 분들이 계신 거죠. Energy self-sufficient villages are pioneering the future of the energy self-sufficient market through a three-step project that includes conservation, efficiency enhancement, and production, such as ESS and electric car charging stations, as well as solar power. From establishing a social economic system to creating jobs and income. 굉장히 많이 도움이 될 것으로 어, 생각이 들어요. 사실 이거를 하기 전에는 저희가 잘 몰랐어요. 에너지가 이제 어떻게 쓰이고 있는지, 뭐 정부에서 시행하고 있는 어, 정책들은 무엇인지 그런 거잘 몰랐는데 많이 느끼는 점이 일반 사람들은 아직도 몰라요. 그래서 이거를 많이 알리기 위해서 저희들이 더 많이 활동을 해야 되고 이런 사업들이 굉장히 필요하다고 생각을 해요. Energy self-sufficient villages, which began with seven in 2012, has grown to 100 in Seoul by 2018. And they are making efforts saving energy to this day. 저는 우리 그 에너지 자립률을 따졌을 때 45%, 46% 이렇게 올라갔을 때요. 저 자신도 아, 그 못했어요. 아. A person who walks along an untouched path for the first time needs great courage. The first time Seoul began the energy self-sufficiency initiative, many doubted the new path. However, walking on a path that no one has previously walked makes us very proud. 우리가 에너지를 왜 만들어야 되는지, 신재생 에너지가 왜 필요한지 이런 거를 같이 교육을 통해서 주민들한테 홍보를 하면서 서서히 사람들이 관심을 갖고 그리고 이제 한 집, 두집 설치를 하면서 너도 나도 좋았다고. In addition, we are still making efforts so that more people will become familiar with these changes. 재미있다기보다 이제 뭔가는 성취를 이루었다고 이제 생각을 하고 있어요. 많은 변화를 가져왔기 때문에 분명히 변화시킬 수 있고요. 지금 변화가 되고 있습니다. 지금 현재 많이 꼭 에너지 자립 마을이 에너지에 관련된 내용만 얘기할 건 아니고 그걸로 인해서 주민 간에 화합해서 소통하고 주민 간의 분쟁도 많이 그 흡수할 수 있는 계속 이어가야 된다고 생각합니다. Seoul's energy self-sufficient villages are not only practicing energy self-sufficiency but also shaping a future for itself through communication within communities. They believe in the power of the saying that collective vision will come true. In Seoul's energy self-sufficiency villages, the sun never sets. After watching the video, I can see that if we have only a small effort, we will be able to reduce 
our dependence on fossil fuels and survive Earth. Next, the second OPEC decision will be led by Professor Che Che Chun under the theme of environmental transformation in the post-COVID era. Please begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I am Che Je Chun. I have the honor uh, to be a moderator today. Thank you very much. As you heard, uh, climate change is threatening the very existence of the human kind. I don't think we can go back to uh, the old normal. We must move toward a new normal, from carbon-based society to perhaps zero to very low carbon society. Paradoxically, the COVID-19 pandemic has raised much needed uh, concerns over uh, climate crisis. Now, as you heard, uh, Professor Bowles very boldly calls for a moral economy, uh, a huge paradigm shift in, in economics and economy, I guess. Uh, with this in mind, uh, let me uh, begin our, our uh, discussion um, with uh, some emphasis on green recovery. Let me first ask a question to Ambassador Smith from UK. Um, looking at the post-COVID era, the world is now seriously talking about Green New Deal or green recovery. In my opinion, the UK is a, is a leading country in this area. You've been doing uh, very well, in, in my opinion, but you must have something to uh, share with us. What's going on in, in the UK? Well, I think we in the UK are absolutely convinced that when we talk about recovery, it has to be a green recovery. When people are looking ahead at what to do after COVID-19, there will be lots of talk about getting back to business. But this cannot be getting back to the path that we were on before, because that path was a path that leads to disaster. Now, you mentioned that the UK has been thinking about these things, as many other countries, for a number of years. And well before, obviously, the COVID-19 virus, the UK had set itself some very ambitious targets for net zero emissions and had taken the additional, in, the additional step of enshrining those commitments in law to say these are not just things we would like to do, these are things we are legally obliged to do. And from that perspective, the UK took the decision to offer itself as the host of the next major conference of the parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP26. That will happen next year now because of the postponement because of COVID, not this year. But that gives us time now for governments across the world to come up with more ambitious commitments to bring to COP26 in November next year really firm commitments to show that we are not going back <laughs> to the energy consumption patterns of the 20th century. We are going forward to take the essential action which gets a grip on the rising temperatures, the rising global temperatures, and pegs that rise in global temperatures at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And one of the really important things in that context of how we do this is going to be looking at how investment works in the future. And that includes public investment, it includes the use of public budgets. Across the world, governments have mobilized immense budgetary resource to address the immediate problem of the COVID-19 virus. What we need to see is equal commitment and equal radicalism to looking at the longer term effects of climate change, which are not that much more long term, but which nonetheless need absolutely urgent attention if we are to get off this path to disaster. But not just public bu budgetary action is, is essential, it's thinking of private investment. 
We should no longer be investing in technologies that do not have a future. We should no longer be investing in technologies that will destroy our livelihoods and our planet and will impact especially on poorer communities across the world. So that's why, again, I think the financial sector, including the financial supervisors who are looking at the quality of investments, who are looking at the security of investments in the future, will need to take very hard judgments to say, no, we are not going to put up with investments in the technologies of the past, investments which will continue to destroy our livelihoods, and we must look to the future, encourage and support the investment in the technologies which will produce for us a safer and greener planet. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm um, quite impressive, and I always admire what the uh, UK has been doing, and let's please keep going along that line, please. Now, let me turn uh, to uh, Professor Bowles. Professor Bowles, you, um, you heard that uh, our uh, Mayor Park mm -hmm. declared in his presentation that the city of Seoul plans to implement a very aggressive uh, Green New Deal policy. And Ambassador Smith explained about green recovery in the UK. What role should the, uh, the civil society, the third poll you mentioned, uh, play in this setting. Anything going on in the US? Um, could you tell us? Um, I'll, I'll respond to the first part of the question first. Um, uh, I, the, um, I, I was very interested in what the mayor said and also Ambassador Smith. Uh, and I think that if we're going to have the kinds of changes that they are discussing, which are urgently needed, we have to think about essentially changing the rules of the game. We cannot leave it to visionary mayors uh, and to particular leaders who have a vision about what we're supposed to do in the world. We've been living under a set of rules of the economic game uh, that's worked tolerably well under many circumstances because most of the stuff that we were trading back and forth were things like shirts and steel and grain, things that you could buy and sell in which... Uh, Basically, buying and selling stuff worked reasonably well. I'm, I'm not overlooking the inequalities and the other problems. But when the economy moves into a world in which our welfare is determined by things that you cannot buy and sell, and you ought not to buy and sell, and if you try to buy and sell them, they will destroy society, we have to rethink the rules of the game. What I'm talking about is... Our welfare today depends on things like grain and steel and shirts, of course. But overwhelmingly, it depends on other things. Like, for example, the, the kind of uh, relationships we have with friends and family and neighbor, neighbors, the kind of knowledge we have. But also, negatively, mm -hmm. the effects that we have on each other through pandemic spread, through climate change, and so on. Now, it's time for us to rethink the rules of the game, which defined capitalism over the past two, two, uh, two centuries or three, which brought tremendous affluence to the world when the world was composed of trading grain and shirts and steel. Uh, I think that the idea that we can essentially organize society well, primarily through buying and selling stuff, has to be uh, reconsidered. It, I'm not suggesting we're gonna do without markets. It will play a huge role but we need some other ways of interacting. That's why I'm so concerned about developing uh, the kinds of concern for each other, the kinds of solidarity, uh, which would allow us to take account of the effect of our actions on others without putting a price on that, because you can't put a price on it. <clears throat> Thank you. It'll, let me now uh, talk about our situation in Korea. Dr. Lee, you, as you know, the Korean government has just announced that it will implement uh, uh, Green New Deal policy as well. Um, could this be a, a turning, turning point for us? How would you evaluate Korean-style New Deal? Yeah. Please. Uh, the South Korean government have been uh, working on plans and policies to reduce 
greenhouse gas emissions, I also participated every time, and, uh, but has never achieved. We didn't achieve the, the reduction goals. So after COVID-19, Korean style New Deal was discussed as a way to revive the economy, including Green New Deal. So Green New Deal has, uh, I think, uh, opened a space for discussion of social reform to transform the Korean society into a decarbon one and to resolve inequality issue. The Green New Deal itself, uh, I think, itself is, Green New Deal itself is not a purpose, but it's an alternative frame and means. With many people interested in Green New Deal, I think we need to use this attention to solve the climate crisis and inequality problem in Korea. Green New Deal is an umbrella policy, as Mayor mentioned. So it covering energy, industry, buildings, transportation, agriculture, and waste. But above all, I deeply agree with the remarks from Professor Che Jae Chan that Green New Deal must be built with projects that include labor cost as a top priority. Professor Che said that Green New Deal focusing on science and people. That includes research on natural ecosystems. That will increase jobs and also the quality of life. But unfortunately, the social consensus about climate crisis in Korea is not strong enough, I think, because many people do not accept this crisis as crisis. In general, climate crisis is hard to feel and it seems uncertain, and the people tend to think of it something in the distant future. However, we are already living in the climate crisis. The IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degree shows that if we do not make change, the global average temperature increase will reach the 1.5 Celsius limit in 2040. And we have only eight years to stop that from happening. If we take this warning seriously, we have to respond to the climate crisis. It should be our top priority. But our citizens are not well informed about this. I think political leaders, civil servants, and the press must take initiative to recognize this problem and try to solve it. Secondly, I, uh, we face institutional inertia of a conventional economy and system, as well as resistance from current stakeholders. The Green New Deal is about transforming into zero carbon economy. We must take a big public investment in a green industry to reduce climate uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, we must carry out institutional reform about existing, we have to uh, inst have a institutional reform on existing soft cities, tax system, and prices. These are all based on fossil energy. So it is very important to uphold the principle of just transition. As Mayor Park mentioned, we have to, no person and no place is left behind. We need to make government and enterprises to take responsibilities in addressing climate change and social inequality issue. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, you can probably talk about everything she raised, but let me, let me just ask you to focus on inequality problem. Inequality problem should not be limited to central government. Now, it is the uh, city uh, problem as well. 
uh, cities will also face this kind of problems uh, uh, directly. What's, uh, uh, what's your solution to, to this issue? I think the disaster and crisis, uh, you know, the damage is coming first and most seriously for the disadvantaged and the privileged peoples. So we should, uh, you know, make consideration uh, for those people in advance. And so, you know, um, in case of Seoul, uh, we had uh, made a great investment uh, in this, you know, beginning start of this uh, Corona COVID-19 on the um, most vulnerable peoples. So, uh, you know, uh, we made um, distribution to the um, citizens who are, uh, you know, um, the most uh, underprivileged in the mass. And then now, uh, you know, uh, as mentioned, Professor Samuel Bowles, uh, we also suggesting to include uh, the such, uh, you know, very um, small businesses or, um, you know, self-employed businesses to be included in the system of uh, employment insurance. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, if we have no such uh, fundamental and drastic measures, uh, the gap between the rich and poor will be more strengthened. So, um, you know, inclusive measures in this age of crisis most important. So uh, do we, in doing so, we can uh, bring more, you know, a peaceful <laughs> society and uh, it can provide more, you know, um, the uh, uh, more potential, as, uh, essential uh, elements of sustainable growth uh, in, you know, ap ap post corona age, era. Thank you. In addition to uh, Mayor's remark, and then if you go back, if we go back to uh, Dr. Lee's comment, she, she mentioned institutional inertia of conventional economy and system and uh, resistance from stakeholders are the two main obstacles to reaching a social consensus. In your opinion, will it remain more or less the same in the post-COVID era? Um, then what should we do about it? Professor Bowles? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that, that was a question oh, to oh, me. I'm I, sorry. Was, I was <laughs> waiting. <laughs> I very much want to answer that. Uh, first, uh, doc Dr. Lee's remarks were exactly on target. And it seems to me that there is a lot at stake when we talk about inequality and uh, the existing interest in essentially a more uh, existing interest in a highly unequal society. Uh, but let me step back and say this. Uh, if we're going to respond effectively to ongoing pandemic crises or, and, to, and to climate change, the key value has got to be cooperation cooperation within countries, between countries, and so on. It has, it's absolutely essential. Now, uh, if, if you look at the examples we have of cooperation breaking down and succeeding, I think it's fair to say what kills cooperation is inequality and economic insecurity. Mm. It's almost impossible uh, to have cooperation among people who are either highly unequal or who don't know actually if the next, if they're, where their livelihood is coming from. So. The, the idea of cooperation to, uh, to save the planet uh, and the struggle for social and economic justice are not just two things that we should be pursuing. We are not going to succeed in, uh, in, in uh, addressing climate change unless we address injustice. And that's not, simply for, that's not solely for moral reasons. It's because the, uh, it, it's very difficult to get the kinds of cooperation, and in particular, I mentioned the danger of tribalism as a possibility, of tribalism arising from economic insecurity and also other, other sources. 
Uh, I think that's a big danger in the form of nationalism and racism and so on. Of course, coming from the United States today, I'm deeply aware of that as our particular problem, but it's also one which is quite common throughout the world in other places. Uh, so I think we have to address those two things together. And, and I think the idea of uh, institutional reform that Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, uh, that's exactly what I think we have to talk about. When I say changing the rules of the game, I mean we should up the ante and think about big changes in the rules of the game because we have a very, very big problem and just a short time to solve it. Thank you. I um, think we have about 10 minutes or so, so <laughs> let me, let me kind of, in, in closing, let me ask each one of you to, to say just a few words about, uh, about this issue. We're talking about, you know, uh, various policies and ideas and talks are beautiful, um, but we have to worry about feasibility, how feasible uh, our thoughts are in, in reality. Um, and Green New Deal, Green Recovery, sometimes sounds too ideal and even abstract to to general public. Um, now, Ambassador Smith, well, perhaps using um, the examples from UK, what should uh, citizens themselves uh, think and do, think and behave in this uh, in this situation, and what would be the uh, what would you do to make the citizens to feel such a way? I think that what I'd like to come back to is the issue that uh, Dr. Lee mentioned of stakeholder resistance, because I think that really impacts on influencing citizens. And I think there are two, to my mind, very encouraging dynamics that one can see in terms of pushing back against stakeholder resistance. One is actually to look at what, across the world, cities, regions, communities can do by taking initiatives that are in tune with their citizens. One example, one very concrete example, is the Powering Past Coal Alliance. Now, there are more than 100 cities and regions that have signed up to this initiative, which basically says, what can we do to accelerate the phasing out of the use of coal, one of the most unhealthy, polluting, uh, emitting uh, energy technologies we have? How can we, uh, how can we accelerate this process? Uh, as I say, more than 100 cities and regions around the world have joined that. Uh, looking at the mayor of Seoul, we'd very much like to see Seoul perhaps join that initiative as well uh, in the future. As well as that, we see a lot of corporations actually signing up to commitments, to net zero commitments themselves. And we see them making great effort to explain that this is not just corporate propaganda, this is real. But we need also a system which uh, builds public confidence in what they're hearing from corporates. The public does not want to hear uh, propagandistic greenwashing slogans from companies. It wants to know they're taking real action. So another really useful practical initiative in this uh, regard has been the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, which is a group that's set up which sets standards for climate-related financial reporting. And again, I think speaks very directly to citizens on the value and the substance and the effectiveness of the measures that are being taken to effect change. Well, <clears throat> not just the UK, the city of Seoul should take the leadership, right? <laughs> right, uh, we discussed many things. So uh, every interested or um, it's different you know, authorities uh, had their own duty to change and to transform uh, from the carbon society to more ecological society. So, um, of course, the city government have uh, the mission to, you know, reduce the carbon emissions drastically uh, in post-corona era. But I think, as you uh, emphasized, the most important is, thing is to mobilize the citizens' power to engage and to participate in this effort, uh, you know, 
to transform. So I, my vision is to invite every citizen you know, to participate in this effort and do their best. You know, just as you uh, watched the um, video clip, in Seoul, we have more than 100 villages who are uh, you know, really trying to transform the civilizations in abroad world, but still, you know, um, they are changing their habits and their thinking, way of thinking on the village basis. I think it's very important. So, you know, we should think globally, but we should act locally. I think it may be true uh, in the post-corona era. And I would like to add one more thing. Sure. So, uh, you know, Professor Samuel Bowles emphasized the uh, solidarities. Solidarity can be, uh, you know, um, witnessed within the site, but at the same time, it should be implemented in, uh, you know, international dimensions. So, Seoul City had already um, established the online platform um, you know, called CAC, mm -hmm. uh, Cities Against uh, COVID-19. So uh, during last two months, more than 7 billion hit the website. Mm -hmm. uh, so it means we can share our wisdom and experience together. And um, so uh, my vision is to establish it a uh, more permanent cities alliance for pandemics. So on which we can share everything. So, um, you know, as uh, Professor Bowles mentioned, you know, in the era of crisis, it's highly tend to bring more nationalism or sometimes chauvinism. Mm. So to overcome all these, you know, uh, problems, um, we should be more, uh, you know, cooperative, and um, collaborative. So I think it's one of our, uh, you know, uh, vision in future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Lee, what's, what's the uh, citizen's perspective yeah. on this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, political uh, will and the leadership of government is as the government to accomplish Green New Deal is, is really important. And the, this commitment comes from citizens' demand. So also in Korea, citizens are making climate crisis emergency response group, and many call for zero coal and the uh, end of eternal combustion engines and more renewable energy and just the transition. And use are preparing for climate lawsuit against the government uh, that are dif indifferent from addressing the climate crisis. There will be heated discussion and the competition between conventional uh, fossil energy powers and the Green New Deal supporters. So I ask for the supporters, uh, support and encouragement of everyone present here today. And uh, as a citizen, of uh, Seoul City, I think Seoul citizens are lucky. Uh, they have a mayor who recognizes a crisis as a crisis and uh, act on the climate crisis as a top priority, as well as many citizens are willing to practice it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Seoul City continuously reduced the emissions when even central government failed to do so. But we have to try more, try much harder. Uh, zero energy construction and the green remodeling are at the core of Seoul City's Green New Deal. Uh, taking a step further, Seoul City announced the, the innovative action plan for construction worker. I was really impressed. Seoul City stated that construction workers who worked on weekdays would be entitled to pay the holidays, and the city will fully cover the social insurances. Mm -hmm. So this is how Seoul City approaches the
the multiple issues of a climate crisis, social safety net, and inequality at the same time. I hope that Seoul City's Green New Deal that addresses climate crisis as well as uh, social inequality becomes a great success. Uh, then Seoul case can be a proof of hope and proof of transition. I really hope to do that. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Dr. Lee, uh, on your good comment. And I really think, you know, the Seoul, and as mayor myself, mm -hmm. I'm very much committed mm -hmm. to adopt all your ideas and professional uh, suggestions. So um, may I invite you all to our, you know, advisor to Seoul Metropolitan Government? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's, it's great <laughs> honor. <laughs> Professor Bowles, um, let me give you uh, more or less the final words. Um, it seems like all of us uh, fully embrace uh, your idea of third pole uh, being in existence. What's, uh, what's your opinion? Oh, we don't hear you. I want to start by saying that for me, this has been a very um, emotional and uh, inspiring discussion uh, because I can see just in the voices in the room, uh, but particularly the leadership of Seoul and the leadership of the mayor, and I'm sure many people around you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that we really can change things. And we don't know in the end what's going to work and what is going to catch on and so on. But the only way we're going to do it is the way you are doing it. And I mean you, the singular, the mayor, and I mean you, the people of that great, uh, great city. Um, let me close with some thoughts that may seem um, a little less inspiring. Um, we see nationalism as a danger. Absolutely, I do. I've been against nationalism all of my life. However, as a student of nationalism, I think it should give us something uh, encouraging to think about. In the course of the 19th and 20th century, nationalisms around the world created solidarity where in the past there'd been nothing but enmity and hostility. Consider, for example, Italy. It was a language, it wasn't a country. It was barely a language. Uh, if the people from Naples hated the people from Milan and so on. Uh, the nationalism that grew during the period of the 19th century put those people together so that they were now able to make sacrifices for each other. The same is true of France. The same is true of the United States. Uh, nationalism has created solidarities across boundaries which we thought were impossible to bridge. Now, if that's possible in a large nation, like, for example, Italy or US or uh, nations like that, I don't see why it should stop at what we call national boundaries. We are capable as a cultural animal of loving each other across wide boundaries and differences. So I think we should learn from nationalism and learn how to make nationalism global so that essentially global <coughs> solidarity would be the last stage of nationalism. That's the first thing. And the second, even more maybe unlikely is, I, I have learned a lot and I think we have a lot to learn from studying the triumph of neoliberalism in the 80s and 90s. What did they do that made them so effective? And what I've taken away from that experience is something which we can do also. Uh, we can combine these four layers that are necessary for a new paradigm. A set of values clearly articulated, not liberty or some uh, emaciated idea of uh, freedom as in neoliberalism, but a broader part of us as part of a community of society and also of the biosphere. And you go on down how they succeeded. They had emblematic policies. In the United States, it was private choice among private schools and so on. Uh, they had an economic view, which is actually, uh, it wasn't, um, they actually produced some uh, highly regarded economic ideas. And we have to do that also, uh, new ones. Uh, and finally, they did in fact ultimately how everyone talks about the economy. Now, fortunately, that's ended. COVID-19 is going to help end, I mean, mm -hmm. if we needed to have any more announcements of the death of neoliberalism, I think COVID-19 is it. Individualism and self-interest are not going to have a good name anymore. But I think we can learn from how they succeeded and work very practically, very deliberately. There is a lot of resources available now to change the game. And I think 
it's our time now. I think we can do it. And thanks for the leadership from Seoul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> uh, for me, it was a great learning experience today. I hope uh, all those people who's been listening, um, same applies to you. Now, the viral pandemic will not wipe us out because enough people die, then there's a, there's a natural social distancing. So the virus will not make us go extinct, but climate change can. Climate change could, could wipe us out to the last person from the face of this earth. We learned something from this COVID-19 crisis. Now we should really apply to climate crisis situation. We should get some, we should, we should get smarter on this issue. And I hope uh, we have a great, uh, we had a great discussion. I hope we learn something from this uh, activity. And thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Professor Bowles. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Professor, and our panelists. Now, today's meeting allowed us to realize that the environmental vision for the future requires global attention and action. I believe it is time for everyone to realize that creating a healthier Earth equals to protecting ourselves. This brings us to the end of the session on climate and environment. And we will now have a short break and continue with the next session from 1 p.m. Korean time. Thank you.